component of this is designed by Baylor College of Medicine Center for Education and Outreach, and they have developed a curriculum guide. And um, it, it's tailored, it's actually targeted toward middle, middle school students, but it, teachers and students from elementary, high school, wherever you are, you can uh, work with this because the curriculum can be tailored, can be modified, it's very flexible. The videos are gonna be available online on bioedonline.org. That's bio as in biology, ed as in education, online.org, as of late January. Now, uh, this, uh, if we could have the next picture. Um, uh, Biosphere has, uh, and these partners have flown uh, similar experiments before with butterflies and, um, and uh, other uh, uh, spiders, I probably have heard from them. And typically, we have reached between 100 and 200,000 students with these. So, in specific, uh, the reason for which ANT's research is important is because they are organized in a, in a coordinated fashion without a central control. So that is something that can be applicable to other kinds of research, such as the brain, the immune system, or the internet. Thank you. And okay, next we're here from Peter Plasser. Thank you, Trent. Um, Welcome everyone, uh, my name is Peter, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here, I'm very honored um, uh, to be here and share a little bit about a dream that four students had, and that is uh, going to find its next step uh, tomorrow when it's going up into space. We started with a very, very simple idea, affordable access to space. Space should be for everyone. It shouldn't be just for, you know, those which are the right stuff, or those which have enough of the green stuff to get up there, but it should be for everyone. And there are two components to that. One is you need to find a way to make it truly accessible for everyone. And the other one is you really have to lower the cost. And lowering the cost has two components. One is you drive forward standards and like work on adopting those standards on as broad a community as possible. And two, you take advantage of all the cost-lowering mechanisms that is happening right here on Earth and find a way to leverage it into space. So with this mission, if we, if we go to the, to the first picture, uh, we are launching the next one of our satellites uh, called Ardusat 2 um, where you see here a picture from the top showing you the, the solar panels, um, a, a custom-made uh, section on top with uh, solar panels we cut and, uh, and glued ourselves in, in painstaking matter um, and an antenna. Now, if you go to the next picture, um, uh, we try to share with you a, a size comparison. What you see in the lower left-hand corner is one of our magic bullets for affordable access for everyone. It's an Arduino processor. Um, it is a processor that has been used all across the world. This is an Apple. This is not the Arduino processor anymore. Um, but what you saw beforehand is an Arduino processor that has been used by literally millions of people across the world from four-year-olds to 100-year-olds. And they have used it to make experiments and to connect the software world with the real world. And what we have done is we have taken that and put it into this satellite. And we have created a process and uh, a capability for students all across the world to develop their own science experiment on an Arduino and using the sensors that we have on the satellite. So we have magnetometers and we have accelerometers and gyros, we have spectrometers, we have cameras, um, we have Geiger counters, there's a whole host of sensors. And they can make these experiments at home and then through our web interface, they can upload it to the satellite and they can run it on the satellite and get their own data. So instead of being forced to like look up in a textbook, how does the Earth's magnetic field look like? Or learn Newton's laws of gravitation and motion? Or learn some computer programming? They can actually run a project in space. They can join the scientists of NASA and run something in space. And we think that's something that, you know, truly inspirational and can have a huge impact on how the next generation, the post space shuttle and walking on the moon generation, gets to experience space. And thanks to, um, uh, to NASA and the program of the, of the use of the ISS, this is the first project of what we are doing with Artisat 2. 
The second component that I mentioned um, uh, that, is, uh, that is a big goal of ours is the creation and use of standards and the lowering of costs. This is a form factor that was uh, invented by two professors, um, Professor um, Bob Twix from Stanford, who actually works with us, and uh, uh, Professor Jordi puig Suari from Cal Poly. And it is by now the single most adopted satellite standard in the world. Um, there's going to be something like 30 satellites of this form factor, actually a bit larger, on this uh, launch tomorrow. Uh, one of the largest numbers, or the single largest number of CubeSats that have been launched. Um, and it's, you have to think about it, it's like one of the largest constellation of satellites being put up in one single satellite, in one single launch, and they all have the same form factor. And what has this created is that people all across the world, at universities, at schools, at, at science institutes, at commercial companies, use that standard to drive down cost. But even more so than that, and we are working with that with, with our uh, friends at NASA Ames who are very keen on, on creating those standards and, and popularizing it and broadening the participation in space. But the other component is, is that thanks to consumer goods and robotics and UAVs and, and security and surveillance on Earth, there is hundreds of billions of dollars of investment that drive down the cost for sensors, for computers, for devices. They always get smaller, lighter, more power efficient, and cheaper at the same time. Now if you do any kind of mission planning in space, smaller, lighter, cheaper, using less power, those are really, really nice features to have, right? I'm pretty sure that anyone who has ever tried to put a sensor on space, they would love to have things being lighter and using less power. And here on Earth, those industries are doing it for us for free. So what we are doing is we're taking literally consumer electronics off the shelf, stuff you buy at Radio Shack, at Best Buy, and you know, maybe on the internet. And we're putting it into the satellite and we're putting it into the hands of students all across the world. There is hundreds of students, um, uh, a large number of schools that are lined up trying to get online and desperately waiting for the launch tomorrow to be successful. And then uh, if we show the last picture, what is going to happen then uh, is that those satellites will be ejected from the ISS. Those are three satellites that have been ejected um, uh, a few months ago, two of which are ours um, called Artisat-1 um, and Artisat X Katan, um, where we are working with already and students are, try, are starting to get access to them. This one is the next iteration and we will serve even more students doing real science by themselves in space. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, let's start with the uh, question and answer here uh, and we'll uh, let me do a quick check in the audience and see who has a question. Start with Ken Kramer in front. Wait for my coming on that side. Hi, Ken Kramer for Universe today. Question for uh, Luis. Can we go a little bit into um, how, how many of these samples are, are going up? Um, how, how much time will the astronauts be working? And I think this is the experiment that's going up and then coming back down on uh, SpaceX. Can you talk about, about that a little? Thanks. That's correct. <coughs> so, uh, for the first question, how many test tubes, how many samples are we flying? So, there are 128 test tubes. We're actually testing 32 different conditions, where condition meaning a different concentration of antibiotic. And uh, it could be a different fixative depending on what the post an flight analysis will be. Uh, half of them will are planned to return back to Earth on SpaceX 3, and the second half are planned to return on SpaceX 4. I'm not sure if I answered it. Why, why, um, why the different flights? Oh, because there's uh, limited space on return. Uh, ideally, they would all come back as soon as possible, but uh, there are more, and uh, there are other experiments that need to come back to Earth too, so there is a manifest. So there's an order to that. And the time the astronauts will work on. Thanks. So the, for the time, uh, so right now they're uh, in Cygnus inside CGBA. CGBA maintains them at 4 Celsius. And uh, there will be at 4 Celsius until uh, about a little bit less than two weeks from now 
when CGV we are going to bring them back up to 30 Celsius. And after a couple of hours, that's when the astronauts start the experiment by using the crank and allowing for the, the fluid in the second chamber going to the first one, and that is the, the E. coli going to the growth medium. So that's when the experiment starts, the bacteria starts growing. After about 18 hours, the second uh, cranking comes, the second activation, and that's the one that introduces the antibiotic. So the first 18 hours allows the bacteria to grow to a specific point where we want it, and then we introduce the antibiotic. Uh, about 32 hours after that second activation, uh, there's the final cranking, which we call termination, because it introduces the fixative, which uh, you could say freezes the experiment, so to speak. Uh, it puts it on hold so we can do our post-flight analysis. Other questions in the audience? Right here. Thank you. Uh, Tarek Malik from uh, space.com. I think I have one for uh, Luis and, and then a follow-up. Um, this ant habitat, uh, you know, we've, we've seen the spiders and the butterflies and some other critters in space and bees uh, uh, are very memorable, but I've, I've never seen ants except in a cartoon. And, and I'm just wondering, because uh, I grew up with an ant tournament at home, how you see kind of like the, the draw to uh, students beyond just the science that you're getting of having animals in space or insects in space uh, and, and how that can uh, really help them just grasp that there's other kinds of science beyond just the astronauts that you can do in space. Thanks. That, that, those are great points. Um, so there is a selection criteria for defining what will be flown as the next educational uh, pro, uh, experiment. As you mentioned, uh, butterflies and um, sp uh, spiders have been flown before. Now, uh, one of the criteria is, is, is it's got to be something that they can have in their classrooms. A habitat has got to be something relatively easy to assemble so that the one they have in their classrooms resembles the one in the International Space Station. Um, and your other question was? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of curious just how, uh, how you hope the students are going to okay. relate to it. Right. So the idea is that because the videos are going to be uploaded in BioEd Online, that teachers can actually go and use them whenever it's best. They, they think it's best in the curriculum of their own class. And uh, the idea is for uh, students to see what's happening in, in Earth in terms of how many collisions there are, how many times their ants, uh, their antenna uh, touch each other, because that's how they, you can count how many interactions there are between one ant and the other. And they compare that against the, the videos. Now, as I, as I mentioned, this is very flexible. So for example, if there's a software uh, uh, professor who really wants to go and, and bring it one notch up, they can actually start doing some video analysis and come up with algorithms. Really, this is uh, anything can be done with this. It's on, on the minds of whatever the students and the teachers want to do with that. And we expect it will be a, a great deal for them because it will teach them about the scientific method, about uh, doing uh, research in microgravity, and the benefit of International Space Station. Thank you. And then just for, for Tara, it seems like there's like this bonanza now of, of science that you can do with everything you can cram on the Cygnus. And I'm just wondering how uh, that, uh, that boon in being able to get stuff to the station uh, will help the crew really ramp up the amount of science they can do. And if there's a, a backlog now, if you think they're going to get too busy with science. Uh, I love the word bonanza. Yeah, there is a boom uh, in the science because of the increased capabilities, and um, we plan that out uh, months in advance, and so we're watching uh, the workload for the crew. Um, that being said, you know, we've seen <laughs> double the amount of crew time uh, dedicated to research in the last year. You know, we, we plan for a certain amount in a given week, um, and then we can plan for more and more knowing what the crew is capable of um, without overstressing them. So. Um, it's, they've been really busy. Our office has been really, really busy making sure that the uh, science is prioritized correctly, making sure the scientists are, are represented on orbit, um, making sure we're talking uh, with CASIS to bring new users to the station, which has opened up a, a huge uh, flood of, of new research for us uh, for station with our goal of maximizing its capabilities on orbit. So one of those capabilities is crew time. Um, one of the resources is crew time. So um, we, we uh, plan appropriately. Some of those investigations are automated and don't require much crew tending. Um, others are human, physiolo human physiology experiments, so they are obviously crew time intensive. So it, it varies. Um, and so it's our job to just find the right balance and, and make sure the, the crew time is being maximized, as well as the other on-orbit resources. But um, it's been a really fun year, at least. And, uh, and, and looking ahead, it's going to be even, even uh, better. So. 
Thanks very much. Okay, uh, I think we have a couple of questions from social media. And just a reminder, if you're watching from home, either on NASA TV or watching a stream online, you can ask your question on Twitter or Google Plus using the hashtag AskNASA. So let's go to Jason and see what we have. Indeed, we've got a couple of questions on Twitter here. The first comes from Zach Crane. Will there be any potential for students to be involved in future